Hey, Rachel. Hey, Rachel, are you there? Yes, I am here, sorry. Hey, that's okay. I'm just curious. Um, when I share my screen like this, what do you actually see on your side? Does, do you see just the window or is there lots of like white space around it? I can never tell how people view it. I see, so it's not as big as a normal full screen. It's about 60% of the screen. There's white space and I also see the participants window. The which window? The participants window from Zoom. Oh, is that me? Is that why? Uh, I was gonna say that's weird that you see that one. Okay. <laughs> that might be. Um, yeah, that was me. Okay, so it, is it okay the way it's being displayed right now, or do I need to change something? I think it's fine. I also like it. Like sometimes when there are comments, I like to be able to see the comments. So this one's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Just want to make sure because a lot of times when I'm watching other people share their screen, especially if they have like 4K monitors, I end up seeing a very small little window of the actual content, and then there's a whole bunch of white space around it, and I can't figure out when that happens yet. Oh, okay. that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, cool, thank you.
Hi, Joe. Hey, Varun. Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Hey, Doug. Hey, Mark. How's it going? Awesome. Excellent. Nice and dreary if you're in Boston. Are you actually getting snow or is it just rain? It's just rain. Just rain, okay. All right, let's see. David, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. All right, cool. Chris, are you there? Chris Porchers? Yes, I am. Cool. Oops, misspelled your name. Hold on a minute. Um, Jim Curtis. Hello. Hello. Louis. Louis, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Excellent. Thank you. Hello. I think that's everybody so far. Clemens, you made it off your flight. Yes, I uh, literally just came into the house and uh, I'm now ready. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the drive from the airport was uh, more adventurous than the flight, per se. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's good. I'd, I'd rather be, I'd rather have more excitement than a car than a plane. Yeah, we're, I, I live kind of in one of the more densely populated areas in Germany, and uh, this was right into the rush hour, so. Uh, okay. Uh, William, were you there? Yep, I'm here. Excellent. And there was someone else that popped up. There it is. Ryan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Steve-O, are you there? I'm here. Oh, thank you, hello. <laughs> yes, I have co-workers. Shh, quiet, quiet. <laughs> quiet. I'm on the phone, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Been there many times. Unfortunately, the dog doesn't tend to understand nearly as well as the kids, so. Uh, Dan Barker. Yep, I'm here. Excellent, thank you. Joined. I know someone joined because I see the list moving. Barum, are you there? Barum? What about Thomas? Yep. Sorry. Oh, Barum, okay. Thomas, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. Alex, are you there? Alex? Yep, I'm here. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thank you. And there was someone else who popped up on the list. Who was it? Viom. Yep, I'm here. Got it. Okay, I think I, I think I have everybody so far. Give people another couple of minutes. We may have a smaller crowd than normal today, depending on whether people are at the CF Summit or not, so. Hi, Klaus. Klaus, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Excellent, thank you.
Hey, Rob, are you there? So Rob, if you can hear me when your microphone does get connected, just speak up a little. Let's see. Oh, we lost Rob. Okay, let's give another 30 seconds or so, then we'll get started. <clears throat> hey, Doug, this is Rob. Hey, hey, Rob. Glad you can make it. Um, okay, is there anybody on the agenda that I missed? I think I have everybody. So, tell you what, why don't we go ahead and get started? Let's go back over here to this page. All right, um, just a reminder, KubeCon coming up. Um, nothing much there to say other than what we say every week. We've got two sessions there. Uh, let's talk about the planning for the Interop event around, I'm sorry, planning for the uh, KubeCon event, especially around the Interop demo. Mark, you want to bring people up to speed on what happened on Monday's call? Sure thing. Uh, we, we had another uh, sub-team break off to talk about Dinnerop. Uh, there is, I'd say, a smaller team than the previous time, uh, and we mainly focused on what would be possible for the, the KubeCon uh, timeframe and, and focused more around uh, possibly what uh, Austin's proposal is uh, around, uh, they, he just submitted uh, 166, which discusses some of, some of the items that he's going to have in his talk, uh, along with a proposed uh, topic of, for, for the demo. So is Austin on? Unfortunately, I don't think he can make it today. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I'd say that we're still grappling with what is achievable by KubeCon, what would make sense and uh, allow for people to, to understand the interoperability concepts. I believe that uh, Clemens had uh, had an action item to be able to provide a function to hook up event grid yeah, uh, that's, through, through, through a function. Yeah, that, that's true. I just have, have had no time. I was traveling the last two days. So I, I will have that tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. And, and in which case, you know, anything that we can do to have uh, producers of cloud events, I think that we have uh, plenty of uh, consumers, you know, with, uh, uh, serverless.com's uh, Van Gateway, Dispatch, the work uh, with uh, Huawei, et cetera, that we can consume them, but it's really producing and ensuring that we know what the interoperability is between them that we can actually decode, et cetera. So um, I don't know that I can talk to uh, Austin's proposal, the demo proposal for e-commerce. We didn't talk about this in the, in the, in the call. Uh, to to the point that Doug made in uh, the the current meeting minutes, he would like for us to meet again 7 a.m. on Monday, and perhaps we can uh, get enough people to be able to talk through this proposal. Right. So at this point in time, I'd, I'd like not to actually discuss cost Austin's proposal because I think most people haven't had a chance to, or his issue, haven't had a chance to really read it yet. But um, are people okay with scheduling another? Uh, KubeCon prep event for Monday a.m. I'm sorry, Monday 7 a.m. Pacific. Okay, not hearing any objections. We'll go with that. I did add this topic though to the agenda later on if we do wanna, if we have time and if people wanna do a deeper dive into it. But I figured people wanna talk about PRs more right now in this call, if everybody's okay with that agenda. Okay, are there any questions from Mark relative to what we discussed on Monday's call, his summary or Austin's issue? Just quickly. I will say that we did have meeting minutes that's in the same, in the same doc, if anyone's curious for more details around, around what we met on. Yep, thank you. All right, not hearing any, we'll keep moving forward then. Thank you, Mark, very much. 
So let's get into the PRs. Now this one, while technically we didn't tag it as 0.1, it is more of a syntactical thing, cleanup thing. If we can resolve it quickly, that's great. If it's gonna to lead to a bigger discussion, I'm gonna defer it. But this one, I noticed that we had a TBD in the spec itself. It's right here. Um, I thought we could remove that now because I think this is already being covered by, in particular, uh, Clemens PR around how we're gonna serialize events in particular for like HTTP and JSON. And he talks about what to do with extensions there, in particular, adding the CE-X prefix. So I figured we don't need this TBD anymore. I need serialization. We'll figure out how to do that. So I just propose to remove that bit of text. Are there any questions on that? Merge it. Okay. And any objections? All right. Not hearing any. Cool. Thank you guys very much. Now let's get to some more fun stuff. Okay. Hold Yay! On. Yes. <laughs> Clemens, you're next. Or, God, hold on a minute. Zoom is Great. getting, it's not creating for me. Here we go. Uh, so, hold on a minute. There we go. HTTP transport uh, the first one. So uh, uh, there was plenty of time, I hope, for people to find this and, and look at it because it's going to be very difficult to explain that whole thing um, uh, in all details uh, on this call. And it should also not be the goal. Um, so what this does is effectively creates an HTTP transport binding. I just want to explain the, the architecture behind this and thinking behind this. And these, these are two documents. Um, this is the HTTP transport binding. What this does is it takes a cloud event and binds it to um, HTTP. Um, it doesn't, it's not specific about whether it's a post, a put, or a get, and it doesn't talk about status codes at all. All it does is a binding of a cloud event to the HTTP message. Um, with that is also a JSON mapping that kind of represents our cloud event as a um, JSON object. Um, based on, um, I think, your own um, uh, input on the matter, uh, we, I made two different mappings. Um, that are, um, one is uh, the, um, um, one maps the event kind of into one single JSON object. The other one is uh, maps the, the, the metadata into the HTTP headers and then um, keeps the event payload uh, independent. So this here is what we're looking at is the, uh, um, it's the JSON mapping. Um, so that's a self-contained JSON cloud event. Um, and here, this also illustrates how the content type functions because that was an objection, I think, from Thomas. It's like, we don't need the content type in here. This actually shows what we need the content type because the content type here is actually, it, de it actually declares what the content type of the data is. So um, I, I understand what it allows. I disagree that it's useful. Um, okay. So we have, a, we have a lot of cases where we need to carry an event um, that is raised by some existing um, application that encodes its event data in um, um, some existing format. Um, because that's something that's being distributed to a target system that understands that. So we need to be able to express that in some way. So, so having, having, an XML, having an XML pay, payload is legitimate, right? Uh, absolutely. And I, I didn't mean I shouldn't have interrupted. Let me give you the chance to actually explain the PR as a whole, and then I can, we can banter back and forth afterwards. I have All right, more. good. So, um, so, the goal, so this is the goal of these two documents. The, the one is, is, is does not JSON mapping. The other one is just a projection into the HTTP message. Then there is a, is a subsequent PR um, that then is, defines the webhook protocol. Oh. And the webhook, pro, so this is kind of the, this lays the groundwork for it. And the webhook protocol, and I don't think we're going to go and get to the, well, there it is, yes. Um, that is actually now specific to, um, to how, you know, how the, the event is being delivered. So it defines you have a post and um, how you deliver notifications. It talks about authorization and talks about an abuse protection feature um, that is leaning on, it's an amalgamation of, of several abuse protection features that um, are existing today in, in such platforms. And this thing gets really specific about uh, post and about various status codes that are being returned, um, um, et cetera. So, so that, th those two things compose. The reason why I'm keeping those two separate 
is um, that the webhook specification, I believe, will be very useful um, to the web community at, uh, overall, even if they're not using our cloud events format, because the webhook today is Wild West. And um, we have a chance here because we have a lot of companies um, in this forum um, who have uh, ways. I think we can go and have a canonical definition of what webhook is, and that's the goal for this. So this webhook specification is something that um, is kind of gets born here. I would love for us, um, you know, as many as we can, to go and take that actually to IETF and make that a proper RFC. Um, and the nice thing about, so, and the way this is designed is that it composes nicely, obviously, with the HTTP um, uh, mapping. So th that could be, so the, the webhook spec and our HTTP transport mapping spec could be one spec, theoretically. Uh, I, just wanna, I just wanna keep them separate because I believe that the webhook spec per se is universally useful. So that's, that's why I've designed, designed it that way. The JSON document is separate because there will be other, there will be the need for other type system mappings that is, for that reason, I have um, already filed, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that um, uh, in f several weeks, I think, the MQP type, the MQP transport mapping. The MQP transport mapping requires, if we want to go and put cloud events metadata into MQP properties, we need to have a type system mapping from cloud events to, AM to the MQP type system. And so I, I basically filed this to, to show that you know, there's a JSON, there's a JSON event, event format and there's an MQP event format and to basically show how those compose. So, so back to the current PR that, that we're talking about, this is really the laying the groundwork for all of this. The, the JSON type, event type, the, the JSON event format is required for everybody to implement. And so the HTTP um, message format is effectively foundational for um, being able to send an HTTP request in whatever form you want. So if you want to go and map an HTTP request, but what you, what you choose to do is you choose to implement a system that delivers events by soliciting them using a GET, that's fine, right? So it, th this specific, you're compliant with that spec if the way how you deliver events is having someone pick them up um, using a get because this defines a mapping that works for a response and you can also go and deliver event with a put if you want to. Um, so I don't want to go and constrain any of that. Um, but then the web, once you layer the webhook spec on top of that, that's exactly when you snap to a common interop model. So I want to make it you know, as flexible as possible for, for people who want to, who want to be, um, you know, do extraordinary things with uh, HTTP using cloud events. And then I want to have one spec, which is very specific for how we push events across uh, platforms. So that's the rationale for this whole thing. Okay. So now it might be good to dive into specific questions that people had about, in particular, the HTTP transport and JSON mapping, right? Yeah. Um, and there have been some comments, I think. Okay. Which one would you like to start with first? Actually, then let me back. Let me ask a quick question, high level first. Can we first focus on the ones that people consider to be showstoppers? In other words, if you made a comment in there, but it's just a, a minor thing and it's not necessarily a blocker for getting to 0 0.1 and we can perhaps fix it in a follow on PR, let's try to skip those for right now and focus just on the ones that people consider to be blockers for merging this PR and getting to 0 0.1. So which one would you like to focus on first? So I, have a, I have a procedural comment before we get to this. Okay, go for it. Uh, so the procedural comment is um, these spec so so all of that work has been around for um, so this has been around for what fourteen days. Uh, the subsequent specifications have been done have been out of also out for a week. Um, I find it deeply problematic when we get uh, comments like uh, the day or the night before this call. Um, I find this um, a little disrespectful. So um, I would. And like the first ever you know, voice of of uh, um, uh, commentary uh, happening shortly before the call, we have a deadline that we agreed uh, agreed to for substantial uh, feedback because they need to be addressed. That's uh, Tuesdays end of day, and so I would pre appreciate if people would stick to that. So that's that before. We, so that's the the preface, and now we can get into the details. 
Okay, so let, let's focus on the uh, on the specific questions or concerns. Um, would you like to mention something, or Thomas, do you want to jump to yours? How do you guys want to work this? Um, yeah, I, people need to need to. I mean, I've 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 addressed everything that I could that I've seen until I boarded the plane uh, today. Um, <laughs> okay, so, and uh, no, so Thomas, let's go to the one that you were talking about earlier. Where is that in the document? So I can start with a less controversial one. Um, I wanted to uh, just expand the rules on where we use percent encoding. Um, because like you know, none of the examples actually percent encode slashes. Um, what, what line number should I go scroll to? Uh, let me double find or double check that. I remember. Oh, here it is. I think. Look for ASCII, uh, US ASCII. It's. I think it's a line two hundred one. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to expand the set of non the non printable ASCII characters non ASCII characters and percents themselves must be first encoded. Uh, that's the only way to make sure that this thing is an actual reversible encoding. Yeah, I, uh, um, I need to point to, um, I need to do a better job here and point to 3986 probably because I, I actually don't wanna define percent encoding here because I think percent encoding per se in 3986 is actually specifying that rule. Um, because I, what I, what I want to avoid is us having requiring a special implementation. So I want to point to prior art, and the prior art should should do the work. Like I want to leverage, like you should be able to call a function that's called percent encoding that's actually implementing Im implementing the standard, and then you should be able to use that. So I'm just not pointing to it, right? So, um, so I would, and I think. So I was quoting effectively that rule, more or less, from the from the URI spec, and um, so I should do a, I need to do a, a bit of a better job in um, in in pointing to it, um, and that's something that I already noted. So Thomas, you're okay with if he just tweaks this to do more of a pointer to that spec rather than trying to repeat it? Uh, sure. I my requirement would be that a a spec compliant decoder must be able to like correctly handle some of the acid cases I gave. Um, yes. So because unfortunately, uh, like I end up having to deal with strings that have semantically different slashes and percent two Fs. And I need to make sure that they actually will decode correctly into the original string. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care to point to the right place in the specification that refers to the implementations that you will be using. Because mm -hmm. if we're using, None of us is writing a new percent encoder um, code. We're all using stuff that's in the frameworks. I just need to go and find point to the right place that all the reference, the all the frameworks point to. So let me just let me just fix that. Okay. Okay. Um, right. Where do you there's, want to there's, also two, there's two more. I think there's two more comments also from uh, uh, from Doug that I haven't addressed yet that I also need to still work on work in. Or no, that was the other spec. Sorry. Go go ahead. No, here. Oh, yes, here, the next one is uh, yeah, from so, Doug. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and this goes back to the fact that like, you know, I, I fully accept that I have been speaking past people a number of times with URI constraints or requirements. Um, like a, my goal would be that there is some way to know a context or interpretation of the URI um, when I misspoke Last week, about URIs allowing no scheme, I was talking about URI references. Um, I, I, I was thrown off by these examples. I, I feel like if, if slashes, like slash leading uh, URI references without an authority, without a scheme are okay, um, that might need to be explicit and maybe we need to backport that to the original spec and call it a URI uh, reference, not a URI. Yeah, see, most places where people talk about URIs, practically r relative URIs are like specifically in these documents, are r relative URIs are also permitted. So I'm like, mm. I, mean, but, I, was, I felt like I was treated like I was crazy for, for re referencing a relative URI reference. Uh, and so I just. It's. Well, let me, let me, let me ask this. So the, the spec right now just says URI. And yeah. I believe what Clemens has here in the mapping is a correct interpretation of that or correct example of that. 
it sounds like perhaps, Thomas, what you want to do is open up a separate issue to, to go back to the spec and say, should we constrain it to be smaller than just a, a URI? Is that true? If you click on the link for URI, it requires a scheme. If you click on the link for UI reference, it's a subtype of that, which allows a schemeless version. Oh, I see. He is correct. And, and the problem yep. with that is that without, when it's a reference, it assumes that the scheme is relative to the context in which a contained document, like a hyperlink in an HTML document. The problem is if this event is without context, it has no scheme to be relative yep. to. And but then I can, I can always make one up, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I am personally fine. Like my use cases are easier off if relative URI references are allowed because that's how we reference things in Google. But I just, I feel like I've been gaslit a number of times in these meetings and I want to at least like ground in technically correct descriptions. Right. So it seems to me at this point, since this is about, this is not about this, right? Well, th this is not about changing the spec at this point in time. So, Clement, it sounds like perhaps you should fix this example to have a full URL. Yeah, I can. I can certainly do that. I, I will prefix that with a with a scheme and just make that clearer. Okay. Yeah, that's all it requires is, is a made up prefix. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna make this a URN. For that's URN, the sorry. Cool thing because if I now pick, take a transport URI, then all hell breaks loose. Yeah. I, I don't want to imply this to be uh, so. If I use HTTP, th this is this is the this is the jail that it, that the XML people broke into when they when they did the namespace thing that they started using HTTP URLs or URLs for everything, and then everybody believed that it was a different thing. And, and exactly. to be fair, like I am totally on board with uh, a subsequent PR, even just saying uh, we will amend the spec to allow URI references, and then simplifying these examples again. Like yeah. that was my life too. All right. Yeah. So it, I think I think URI references, uh, from my perspective, URI references will be fine. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think having these to be full it's URIs so will be will be more powerful. And you always have that option. But I think having because what we value is really the the um, the structure of the URI and having um, uh, you know a, a base specification for what that structure needs to be. And if you don't really care about the host name, um, and if you don't care about them being transport, then it's not clear that you really need to have them to be fully qualified. Yeah. So it's, would someone like to take the action item to open up a follow on PR? I can do that. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Um, and to be fair, like this is where I kind of wish that we would require that a, a relative URI actually has a, um, an authority. I don't know how, much people that resonates with people or what's yeah, I mean, we wouldn't want that no no we don't want that and i mean we encounter this with the, with the cat off spec is is that it's, it's all about being able to make sure that the person who created the scheme is able to make it a, a unique claim it's a unique identifier and, and prove it if if, if sure. Shot. Sure. So i'm saying either a scheme or an authority would be no. well so perhaps we could save that for a different discussion and yes. focus more on this PR right now. Okay. So what's the next issue in here you want me to scroll to? Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. I, I think we can finally get to. Um, so I, I absolutely understand that we can create a demo sample that has mixed content type encoding. Um, I think that the idea of the binary encoding versus the structure encoding is very elegant. And I think that uh, when you use the binary encoding, you're free to use any content type you want. You don't have to invent anything new. You can use the HTTP content type header. Uh, structured encoding, uh, I would personally prefer we just say, hey, you use the same encoding for your structure and your data. And so if you want an, an XML uh, event, then you either use the binary encoding or you like help push through a way that the entire event envelope can be represented in XML. So, yeah. where, is, where, so, so second, where, where should I scroll to, Thomas, in the, in the, in the PR? Because we are looking at the same thing. Yeah. I don't think this is the right section. Uh, let me... So I can, I can give you, I can give you uh, um, feedback on that one. Um, 
So the structured encoding has, and, and I'm actually mentioning, it, mentioning that in the documents by where I'm not contrasting them. The, the, the binary encoding is really there for efficiency and it's, it's really meant for cases where you care about, um, it, where you care about encoding a binary as a binary and that's a, that's a high order bit. And then you want to go and put the, the rest into the transport frame. And that's for cases where, and we had these IoT use cases mentioned, where you really care about footprint and you only want to have a single single implementation and you don't want to go and, and also employ your you know adjacent encoder in the whole um, in the whole business necessarily for everything. And 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 where the goal is really to push some existing arcane weird event data that comes out of an existing device and just push that over to the other side, but in a standardized way using some common infrastructure. Um, the reason for the, the structured event is that it's actually routable. So you can go and push that, you, and, and this is practice in our, in, in our systems. So um, a, an event shows up in Event Grid, it flows through Event Grid, it actually gets handed off to an event hub. From an event hub, um, it goes through a um, um, complex event processing pipeline, potentially, and then, then gets archived. So there's like four different hops. And the nice thing about that self-contained JSON is that it's completely routable because everything you have about that event is in there. But the, in, that, in that model, the event payload might quite well be XML. And that's, a, that's perfectly legit. The, the real event is, is XML. And our, in our cloud events uh, format, the JSON, is really just the envelope. So we should, um, and I think there's le just the legitimate use cases for it, and ours and this this routing use case is is motivating that that the event data, the core event data that's produced by your application, is in a text format or a binary format that you have. Um, and if it's in a bi binary format that's not representable by text, you put it in Base64, and if it's text format, you put it into text, and then you route that entire block of of JSON, so that entire JSON object through all those various steps. And if you, if you were using the bi this binary format for that, obviously you, you, then you, are, you, need to, you need to carry all these, these transport headers out of band. So the binary format is really just meant for a single hop. And the, the structured format is really meant for multiple hop routing of that exact same event. Thomas, does that help any? I, I don't know. I guess in some sense I recognize that uh, we may go through some untrusted or not untrusted, but I guess uh, non-compliant proxy, I guess. Um, I don't know if I really, I'm trying to, to figure out how much I buy the idea that this format that is that nicely separates data and context that um, doesn't invent new double encoding formats, why it, it is necessary yet not good for everything. Like I, I honestly expected the spec was going to end up with one encoding format that looked a lot like the binary encoding format. Yeah, but there's th those two cases. So if I if I if I would would uh, do this kind of just as a product spec, the binary the the binary model would probably not exist because I need to have the data routable. I so that's the thing I'm trying to, to grasp is why is the data less routable? Because because if you have HTTP headers, so, so yeah, you have an HTTP header that comes in on one side, mm -hmm. and you have a payload, and now you need to go and route that off to while some other place that's using AMQP, that's using MQTT, then all of a sudden now you're doing transport protocol mapping, uh, transport protocol header mapping to transport protocol header mapping. And the reality of that is that you will have a gateway that does your external um, um, protocol handling. And now you're kind of dragging transport context um, through your entire implementation so you can go and spit out a, a transport uh, um, something transport compliant with you know, headers out on the other side. So that's not very pragmatic. So, so I'm, I'm trying to weigh the relative cost of making sure that HTTP headers are forwarded 
versus worrying about a future where there's more than one. Uh, so, so let me let me tell you, this is not a, this is not that's not a theory. We're actually having that in production, uh, just with a different format, with our own format, and this is exactly what we're doing. We, we events come in. They get pushed through event, through event Grid, they land in Event Hub, they then land in, uh, um, sometimes in, in, Avro, in Avro containers, get picked up by Hadoop, and then get processed. I mean, this is something that just happens. The, those, those, those events even go to disk, and I, then get, get rehibernated from disk. So I need to have them together in one place, and the payload inside of them may be XML. I, I get that you need to all in one place. My fear is that we're eventually going to um, ossify that JSON is the best transport because otherwise, like the elegance of the HTTP header solution is that regardless of like what encoding someone wants to choose for the, the yes. overall event envelope, that they are going to have um, one way that they know how to access and route based on a particular feature. If, if they do HTTP, but if you do, if you do something else, then you need to have, then, then um, if, if you need to have, if you need to have routing and you go to a different protocol, then you don't have that, then you have an issue because now you don't have the data together. We, and, and, we suspect that the, there will be a way of showing this context or metadata in any, any transport. Yeah, but the point is, the, 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 and the reality, in the reality of an implementation, is if you don't keep the data together, then you have you have simply proprietary framework over here context and proprietary framework over here context that you now need to go and map to each other, instead of just putting it all into a single JSON object and be happy with it. And it's not precluded that you carry arbitrary data. You just need to basically for encode it. That's the only cost, because content type basically says what this what the data field contains. And if it's not a text format, then it is binary and then it's base64 encoded. So you can tell. Okay. I, I don't see how we're going to stop speaking past each other. So I'm not sure what the... All right, next so, I, I, so, so our position is that we believe that it's important to carry arbitrary payloads as strings and a binary and to be able to carry them also in a JSON envelope. And that's the one that we have here. So let me, let me jump in because I, I want to make sure I understand something. Cause I think something you said there at the end Clemens is some, is the thing that I think resonates with me, but I want to make sure I have it right. And that's if the data it's it, we're talking about the JSON encoding version. Yes. Um, if the data itself is encoded in some way, let's say base 64 encoded. Yeah. As the receiver of that, I don't know how to decode that into something else like XML or, or something um, that, that, yeah, I just don't know how to decode it or what to try to decode it into without the additional content type property sitting right next to it. Is that, that right? Is correct. That is correct. That is, that is absolutely correct. Does that make any sense, Thomas? Or if you don't think the content type property is necessary to do the decoding, how would I as a receiver know how to decode that binary data without knowing what, what, what to encode it or what to decode it into. So I'm saying that the binary spec doesn't introduce this problem. Correct. Yes. Well, but, but what it does is it takes the exact content type field. The content type field for the binary spec originates, right, in our cloud events, in our cloud event specification. So it is the same field that I'm mapping into the JSON is the same field that I'm mapping onto an HTTP header in the um, in the binary version. It is the same field. It's just mapped differently, and the spec actually says that. So so it so yes, it is. It doesn't introduce that problem because it's specifically designed so that the content type field out of the abstract um, info set for uh, the cloud event maps to the real content type field in in the binary case and maps to the content type field inside of the JSON packet in the other case. But it, in both cases, that describes the body. And the body in one case is contained in the data field in JSON, and in the other case, it's in the, in the body section of HTTP. Okay. Uh, I disagree, but I don't need to be convinced or right or whatever. It's, this is not a, we don't require unanimity. 
Well, okay, let me ask this question then. Is this something that you feel has to be resolved before we get to 0 0.1? No. Okay. Good. Are there other topics or questions about this PR from anybody, not just Thomas, but anybody on the call, who they like to, that they like to discuss because they feel like it's a blocker to accept this PR for 0 0.1? Going once. Okay. Uh, let me ask the question slightly differently then. Is there any objection to accepting the PR as it is right now? With the assumption, of course, that follow on PRs can always come later to, to tweak things. Everything in our. Sorry, I did actually have one. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Thomas. I forgot about. Um, yep. I was actually not overjoyed with making a the new content type for application cloud event and then plus encoding, uh, largely because it just breaks off the shelf headers or off the shelf um, web frameworks. Yeah. So for example, we'll have to come up with a new, uh, like Google Cloud Functions will break, I suspect something like Lambda would break. Um, they'd all have to learn how, learn about our new content type and that, oh, it's actually JSON. Well, we, but that's what the the extension that I so the plus JSON extension or the extensibility of media types is something that's an, that's a that's an RFC, and it's pretty widely used already. And what we're defining a media type, I mean that's what we do here, right? So why wouldn't we not declare it media type? Because we, we actually have the exact case here where we we're defining a media type, and then we have multiple renderings for that media type. So the exact case for which um, the, um, the um, specification that I've been referencing, now I need to go and find the reference at the bottom of the document because I don't have them all in my head. Um, and that is the uh, RFC 6839. Um, that is um, basically defines the additional media type structured syntax suffix and the plus JSON. And it's really simple to fish this out because you can do plus JSON. And you can teach all web frameworks that I know, um, you can teach uh, a mapping for what a content type means. Because it's a common, it's, it's commonplace that, that you have media types that are expressed in JSON. That's not a, it's not an unusual thing. Sure, um, I just, I would want it to be, I'm just trying to express my point that this will break known software. This will break known services. I understand that they have not implemented every spec under the sun uh, and that they can be improved in a spec compliant way. So, uh, so let's, I, let's, let's do this. Let's try. I, so I want, I want, I want to have a registration um, for our own media type, um, which, because it also you know, make, makes the standard f legit. Um, and uh, if we find out, that the media type turns out to be a real blocker, um, and that's something we'll find out in interrupt testing, then we should go in and figure out what the rule ought to be um, and whether we need to go and revert it. But I think, I think it should, I'm not, sh I would be surprised if it really broke a lot of stuff because that's how media, how media types work is that you, if you define a format um, of that sort, then um, you are introducing a media tab for it. So I would like I would like to make this make this kind of if we if interrupt testing proves that we're we're causing pain with that, then we should go and revert it. Okay, uh, I can abstain if we just create a bug to track it and try to set up our rule on what we think is too much breakage before we actually do the experiment. I'd just like to be scientific about this. Is it okay if I tag you with an AI to open an issue to track this? Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, I would just like some other voices about uh, before we actually get the measurements, I'd like to, to kind of predict what would be an acceptable amount of breakage and what wouldn't. Okay. okay. So just I, I'm not having a media type is a little weird. Okay, I'll fill that in later. Okay. Anything else, Thomas? Nope. Okay. Anybody else on the call have any other issues they'd like to bring up relative to the PR? Okay. Are there any objections to accepting the PR as is? Again, with the assumption that further on PRs can come in and change things in any of our documents. Uh, 
All right, not hearing any objections. Great. Back over here. I have two, there's two comments that you made, uh, Doug, where you, are at, where you were asking for a must uh, um, rule. Um, and I'm still gonna add those. So if you, uh, if you wanna merge this at the end of the day, it's, it's, two, it's two little things I'm gonna. I'm okay, just, but tell you what, I don't wanna be, I don't wanna hide things. So let's find yeah, exactly. those two spots to make sure everybody's okay with that. Because otherwise I was gonna ask for a follow on PR. So let's find them. Must. Where were they? Um, I, Looking at them in the at, in the JSON spec, I think. Okay, um, here's the first one. Um, okay. Yeah, you say must uh, must the, become, yeah. that, it's right here. Everybody, take a look at this sentence. We just have to add the word must become members of the JSON object. Okay. You don't know. And I think the other one is right above that. Yeah, any questions on this one before we move on? Okay. And where's the other one? Oh, no, that's below that. All right. <laughs> but okay. it, was, it was very, it was similar. Oh, it was just only one. Maybe. <clears throat> no, I think that's it. Oh, here we go. Uh, yeah, there's the other one. So he says this content type header must be set to the media type, and I think it needs to be must be set. That's so. Those are the two things that I'm still going to go in and okay. and and then you can go and Okay. Are there any concerns with those two changes? So I think the intent was for that to be required. He just didn't actually have the normative yeah, order. Yeah, that that was the intent for both of them. Right. Okay. Not hearing any objections, we'll approve this with those two minor changes. Right. One minute. Hold on. Okay, type system is the next PR for 0 0.1. Wanna quickly talk to this one? Uh, yeah, so the reason why I even needed the type system is because I, I broke out the, the JSON serialization and then also the, the AMQP serialization kind of as a proof point. And then realized as I was, as I was writing the JSON specification that I really had no, um, no types to refer to. We had we had used types, or we're using types in the uh, um, in the document, but we hadn't really said what they are. So this is basically just summarizing what they are. Um, and uh, the um, yeah, well, that's that's what it does. So basically, just move some of the the definitions, kind of inline definitions that we had with the property types, um, moves them up here, and then consolidates that. Yeah, and then down below, it just actually uses all the various types. I don't think there's any other changes. Yeah, exactly. That's what that does. And right. we had a, and then the only change was um, there's uh, object, the object type is newly introduced. Um, and that's really meaning to be, we have a bit of a discussion in here. We have a, um, um, the object type is uh, in JavaScript is different um, because um, Java doesn't have an any type. Um, in, J in Java and in C sharp and F sharp and in Python, whatever object is really the, the can be anything object. And that's, um, the, and that's the meaning of that. And it's really just trying to be a variant. But if I call this variant, then it becomes weird in more places. Um, so um, for the kind of the mainline uses of what object is in most languages um, and being a variant type, um, that's really what that means to be. And it's really just meant to be a an abstract type system where I need to have one word that then stands for either a string or a map or a binary. That's really what that what that is for. So I don't want to make don't want to be more scientific about it. Same thing with with map. Um, that is a list of um, is a list of, of things. And I think if you only need to have a map of strings, you can you can write this. I don't want to go and introduce kind of a templating mechanism just for the for that purpose. So I want to keep this super simple. I just need, need, want some clarity on um, on what I can refer to um, from the mapping specs. Okay, now I don't think Sarah could make the call. So Thomas or Rachel, do you guys want to talk about this one or try to represent Sarah's comments? Like, actually, Thomas, you had a comment in there too. Do you want to talk to this one? I mean, if I'm going to try to guess for her, uh, I agree that variant is something that like I get as a former OS developer um, and would probably be scary to other people. Yes. <laughs> um, I, 
Uh, I do kind of prefer any. I know it's not the objects, it's not the JSON spec name, but it is very, very clear what it means compared to objects where most people think, oh, JavaScript object. Um, I, this is not the hill I'm going to die on, and I've taken it up enough time today. Well, okay. So, so, so Clemens, just out of curiosity, do you have a, obviously you prefer object, but is any something you could live with, or do you want to stick with object right now and deal with this later? Uh, we can have a dis debate about this later. We could go and probably do an edit um, on it. Um, I I don't care. I don't care as much about names as it seems. Um, so you know, in the end, this can be this can be any. I think it's just a um, uh, this with that you pick up C sharp and JavaScript developers and a bunch of other people easier. Um, then if you're introducing something that's that's kind of artificial and doesn't show up anywhere but in TypeScript. I'm sorry, you lost me there. Are you saying keeping it as object picks up more people yeah. or keeping yeah, changing picks up, picks up I think keeping it as object picks up more people. That's my that's my feeling. Okay. I'm just well, I'm just I'm just wearing my education hat hat there. <laughs> okay. Well that's I I would call it a var for if you wanted to uh pick up the JavaScript people, because like I said, it, it is actually a name collision with JavaScript. They'll be familiar with the name, but they'll interpret it wrong. Let's, 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 I would propose let's merge it because, because, um, and then let's file an issue on it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not wedded to the name. I just, it's just a discussion that's, we can have separately. It's just that we had this conversation last week as well, and we have yeah, the we object and it hasn't changed. So, no, I actually, I, I, as you can see, two days ago, I made a comment on this, which is um, wh where I'm rationalizing why it stays as object. So I, I agree it hasn't changed. We talked about it last week. Um, I'd like to have a figure on this one. Well, that, okay, well, okay. That's what I was going to try to get to. Or that's what I was wondering about is I'm not hearing a, a, a proposal that everybody can live with yet. So we're down to basically... Accepting this as it is, or, or, or potentially accepting it as it is. Is it um, any suggested right there? Don't we suggest any? Say that again. No, we we can't we can't merge we can't merge the job the the JSON mapping without having this. So let me ask this question: Is this something that we can live with for right now and open up another issue to to track this to see if there's a better word other than object? Because I'm not hearing anybody say they're against switching from object. We just couldn't find the right word yet. So I thought everyone was against switching from object, and we just need to find the right word to do that. But the problem is we haven't been able to find that right word yet, and I'm not sure anybody wants to hold up 0 0.1 to find that right word. OK. That's my stance, yes. So that's why I'm proposing to make some forward progress of let it all go in, open up an issue to say, we need to revisit the word object there. Because I'm not sure that's, that should be a showstopper for 0 0.1. At least that's my opinion, but I want to hear what other people think. I mean, because this is, it's literally just an abstract thing that, is, that it creates references between two specs. Nobody's going to write code that uses that. Okay, we're this bringing... Is, it's literally just a spec construct. So there's one thing I want to get to today, but on this one, is that a path people can live with? I'm not saying it's perfect. Is that something you can live with for right now? Accept, accept object right now and open up another issue. And I'll even tag it to Clemens, <laughs> if that's okay with you, yeah. Clemens, to revisit this. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Is there any concern or objections to that? OK. Are there other issues on this PR that people would like to bring up? OK, let me ask him more formally. Is there any objection to accepting this PR as it currently stands with the assumption that we'll have that AI to revisit object? OK, thank you. Now, Thomas, you wanted to talk about this issue. Hopefully, we can get it in quickly. I was just curious. Um, I was under the impression that 0 0.1 uh, was something that, like. I, I was under the impression that last week we had made a comment that at, at 0 0.1, things will start to solidify in the core spec, um, in which case I was not necessarily sure I was comfortable with some of the things that we've not really talked about, how they're going to be used, what, like, they just kind of were, were grandfathered into this spec. 
Um, and I just either getting uh, clarity that these will not be final and they're still just as volatile as before or saying, hey, they haven't actually gone through scrutiny yet. Let's cut them until we actually have the ability to scrut scrutinize them. So my assumption, and people, please correct me if you have a different opinion. My assumption is that tagging this as 0 0.1 has no meaning relative to the uh, permanence, permanency of anything in any of our documents. Everything's still changeable, and there is no guarantee of backwards compatibility. That's correct. If this is simply, in my opinion, this is simply to have something that people can point to as they code up for the interop events that we're hoping to do at, at KubeCon, and we can all be looking at the same document and not looking at something that's changing potentially. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the exact intent. Like we need to have a we need to have a, a, a specification version that we can all we can all point to and and use, and um, and all the fields that you're pointing out, uh, Thomas, are all optional. So if you don't like them, you don't need to use them. And I think I I, I, I can see that schema URL is gonna is gonna drop off. Um, um, I'm not sure how many people are gonna use that in the end, um, but we should not. Uh, it, we're just we're just basically putting a label so that everybody can look at the same thing, and then we just keep going. So Thomas, does that alleviate any of your concern? Yeah, if, I mean, if we can just close it with documenting that we all agree that there is no implied stability reverse compatibility, then I think that that captures the concern very well. Okay, now is that a comment you'd like to see just in your issue or is that something you'd like to see in the spec? In the issue is fine. Okay, I, I can take that action item. Okay, in that case, um, I believe with that, we resolved all the open issues and pull requests that are tagged as 0 0.1. So let me ask this question. Are there other issues or PRs that, that I forgot or that people know about that we should be looking at before we think about tagging this as 0 0.1? Okay. Is there any objection to tagging the version of the spec with these two PRs merged as 0 0.1? And wait a little longer. <laughs> I don't want people to necessarily feel rushed, but we keep in mind that we do we need people to start coding stuff up for the interrupt event coming up. Any concerns or objections to tagging the merged PRs at 0 0.1? Okay, done. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, sorry, approved. Um, with approved PRs. Okay, now I did have a question offline about the Monday meeting that we agreed to have at 7 a.m. Uh, Rob Dolan was wondering whether we could possibly push it out one hour to 8 a.m. because there are some folks on his side who may not be able to make it. What do people think? Is there any Works. objection? Is there any objection to moving it to 8 a.m. Pacific instead of 7 a.m. Pacific? I'd like to get the acknowledgement from Austin as to which time he can attend because of his PR. Okay, um, I can take the AI to send him a note. Um, and then can, if you can send him a note and then just broadcast out onto both Slack and email, which, which time was agreed upon. Okay, so let me make it a little more formal. Uh, because I do, I do agree that Austin's presence is kind of critical since he's the one driving at least that scenario and it's, it's his issue. Um, is there any objection? And Doug, if, oh, yeah, uh, Go ahead, Ron. I was just going to say, if, if Austin can't do 8 a.m., then please keep it at 7 a.m. Well, He's that's definitely more important than I am. Yeah. But, well, that's what I was going to suggest was, what if we tentatively go for 8 a.m.? I'll take the action item to reach out to Austin. And if he cannot make 8 a.m., but he can make 7 a.m., then we'll switch it. But if he's okay with 8 a.m., then we'll stick with 8 a.m. So basically, we're, gating, we're, we're letting Austin decide 7 or 8 a.m., basically. Does that sound fair to everybody? Yes. Okay, so tentatively 8 a.m. Pending, <laughs> pending Austin's availability. Okay, um, I don't think we have time. We only have three minutes left, so I don't think we have time to dive into anything deeper. So let me just do one quick thing. Um, Matt, I did hear you. Eric Erickson, are you there? Eric? Yes, I'm here. Yep, okay. sorry. And, and David Lyle? 
David? David states in chat that he doesn't have a mic. Oh, good enough. Okay. He's at least alive enough to hear me. That's good enough. Okay. So we have a whole two minutes left. Is there any topic anybody would like to bring up at all that we can cover in two minutes or at least start to cover in two minutes? Can you post the time, the decision on the time for Monday's meeting? It's 8 a.m. Monday, 8 a.m. Pacific time, Monday, pending Austin's yeah. availability. Okay. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember to send out a note about that too. Hold on a minute. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, any other topics? Uh, you should expect my uh, the two changes that I'm going to make to that spec um, within the next two or three hours. And you get notifications and everything. So thank we'll you see. very much. Okay. Um, as a small question, since it seems like everyone was assuming that we were going to use URI references anyways, do we mind just assuming that that will be part of 01? Tell you uh, what. Well, I was going to say, what if you open up a PR right now, Thomas, to make that change, and I'll. If people can LGTM it uh, offline, I will wait until tomorrow to, uh, to create 0 0.1. And if I get enough LGTMs, we can merge that PR. Okay. Right. Uh, I have a meeting for the next hour and a half, but I'll do it right after that. Not a problem. Is that, let me ask you, is that okay with people? I know it's very, very rushed, and I'll, I'll try to send out a note to warn people. But is that okay with people? No, it sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. I'll try to make a note of that here somewhere in the minutes. All right, with that, I believe we're done. All right, cool. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye, guys. Thank you. Fantastic. Bye. Thanks.